kind of market. I didn't, I didn't do too much, so we started the recording. Um, okay, we're gonna get to run it. So the recording is on. Um, if you're gonna get, you know, a few short instructions, this is what's happening and take care of it. Well, now, you, you know, you have the advantage of being able to see it in print, to think about it, to digest it. And with time, it gets natural how to do all these things. So I'm gonna start by uh, reading the case for those who didn't read it yet. It's uh, six, nine, we you know, between last course, Ruben was, who was buying, um, was doing two things. Ruben is buying a summer home to rent out. And he also has been dealing with Plony Almoni. He's uh, spending more time with him since Louis. He, had his, he has an employee, if you recall, um, for the, that uh, younger man in Lakewood, the middle-aged guy, he's 50 years old, and we created an invoice for Plony Almoni. So now, Plony Almoni comes in with $1,000. What's this $1,000? He wants to pay off all his bills, and he wants to have a retainer for upcoming services, which will be discussed in person. So what is Polonia Moni's outstanding bills? That's the first thing you have to understand. So obviously, for those by now who might have opened up the QuickBooks file, and uh, by the way, I, I invited people in the email, to not, not necessarily to give the feedback, but also to give examples of real life examples that we could discuss in class, if you'd like. Um, if you think you have better imagination, you know, we uh, encourage the inter interactive, you know, like, you know, responding to about 50, 50 emails, questions how to adjust, you know, um, entries in QuickBooks is not as easy as doing it in Q&A and it's definitely, um, that's the intention. When I do Q&A, I could display and you could see what's going on. But if you want to submit some information to be incorporated into the class, I can do another attempt to do so. So for those who already opened up their QuickBooks file, um, and Blue Nether will try to take care of the black issue by next class. Um, last time someone wrote to me and mentioned that there's, a, there's something about it on the internet, but I haven't yet uh, figured out how to do it. And again, Halavai, for everyone, if this was an in-person class, I wouldn't have to do with any of this technical support. But we live and learn. So if you would go to customer center, how would you go to customer center? One of three ways. We have the home page. We go to customer center. We have over here, we can just go to create invoices, but we don't want to create a particular invoice. We want to see customers. So the shorter way to do it is just to click on the icon up here on the top. The icon of customers. Let's see, I'm trying to make sure I see it on mine. Okay, customers. And Plony Amoni, outstanding invoice is bills, $300. Okay, so that would leave $700 to be used as um, a retainer will be classified as unearned income. It's a liability, okay? It got, the, the debit, we have the cash, we go to the bank, we have the asset. What's the credit? Well, it's not equity. We didn't revenue, like I explained to someone, expense and revenue adjust our equity. When we have expenses and we pay it out, it brings down the equity. We have revenue, it brings up the equity. When it's unearned revenue, it's a liability. We don't own it yet. So the debit would be the debit would be for maybe undeposited funds. There's no receipt to take. So we just, um, we could probably make a debit and credit, debit uh, the bank, Chase, $1,000. We would credit his invoice, $300. Or you might receive $1,000 against the, you could do that also. You could receive $1,000 in a $300 invoice and leave the change as a credit. We could do that as well. But for the bright ones among us who recall that plenty of money wasn't really $300. Plenty of money really should be charged $375. There's one hour of unbilled 
um, work. And we did it at the time we did it just to show that the employees are entitled to their money, their five hours of work, despite the fact that the revenue was not earned yet, only on four units. Again, with the employee did five units, and you would think automatically the company earned five units of revenue. And we explained in the previous class that is technically true. We did the work, we're entitled to it, but QuickBooks does not know of it until there's an invoice. If there's no invoice, then there is no, there's no revenue. And that's why we, we made an invoice of four units and we left one unbilled to, to, to demonstrate that. That QuickBooks recognizes not the 375 of work for the work, but the services provided, but only the $300. So the first thing would, but the 200, but the, I even remember who the employee was, Pinchas Tadras, I believe, yeah? He earned his $200. He did earn his $200 for his work. So we should just go ahead through Income Tracker, if you call the Income Tracker, and we will generate the first invoice of $75. You have it right in the bottom, $75. For those who want to follow along, you can select and you choose billable, and it's going to come up one more $75 unit, and we'll create an invoice. And you see right now it shows you on the underlying screen that there was an open balance of 300, an unbilled time expense of 75. And there's a previous time that he paid $670 for whatever that was, five hours of probably housekeeping or something like that. Um, the details really doesn't make a difference at this point. And I press OK. And we're going to save and close. Now, it's asking for email at the point of money because it says email later. So we're going to uncheck the email later. Okay, we uncheck the email later. We did make, I believe, an email address for for some other invoice for Mr. for Gabay at Shomer Shabbos. But point of money is a uh, he likes to keep a low profile. He, you know, usually if you remember he pays in cash. And now we have plenty of money. You can see here, the first invoice we made in 6-1 was $300. The second invoice from 6-10 today is $75. If we go back to customers, we will see that now his, he is $75. And I'm gonna spare you the effort of looking at the reports because we know the report last time showed 300, and now the report will show 375. Incidentally, uh, just as there's an income tracker, right? There's an income tracker for all the services, the invoices we send out, there's also a bill tracker. We'll keep track, on the, right next to the income tracker is a bill tracker of what's overdue. You see, we didn't pay Con Edison for a while. If you recall from last, it's almost a month, right? It was due two or three weeks ago, but there's no shutoff notice due to COVID-19. There's a shutoff notice that won't turn us off. So we're not worried about Con Edison. We're not worried about National Grid. Ami Magazine, yeah, they should get the 250. They're gener they're, you know, maybe, maybe some people found out about us through Ami Magazine. And already after Shavuos, we already sold the TLS, we sold the MR, and we see here the invoices for $100 each, right? So this is a bill tracker. Then everything else is paid. We have um, correspondence. There's a difference between item receipt and bill. What's the difference between bill and item receipt? We discussed. A bill is when you actually enter the bill of the dollar amount and the, and the receive the product. Item receipt, we just entered that we received a product, but we did not enter the bill against it. And because we didn't enter the bill, that's why <coughs> it's not overdue. It's only overdue when there's a bill. And when we enter a bill, that would be using, okay, if we go vendor, enter bill for received items, Probably that's what we do from the car's farm. We'll enter a bill for the $50. Um, vendor, go to uh, vendor McCar Safari, and there you go. Received items. We never did it. Once we enter the bill, and the bill we know will be $50 because that's the cost of goods, right? Um, once we enter the bill, then it's going to change it from an uh, item receipt to a bill but you will have to pay. Okay, so this is the review of the first part of the case, is that when you, a customer owes you, now it's 375. So 
he's only gonna have 625 as a credit. Let's try it that way first. Before the debits and credits, we'll do the debits and credits in the second half. Let's receive a payment. So customers, and now if you recall, we're gonna, we're gonna right click Plony Amoni automatically. It's gonna bring us into the receive payment of, of that individual person. If we would go to customer center and receive payment, then we have to choose a customer. If we're highlighted Tony Amoni, it's gonna receive payment. And when we automatically click the invoices, now it's two invoices, we, you have to click one at a time. You could also, if you just click it, see it's 300, click another one, it's 75, 375. But well, we're gonna enter $1,000 because that's what he's giving us. He's giving us $1,000. And if you're happy, it shows here is an overpayment of 625. I'll highlight the cash because that's what we know about this customer. And it says, you wanna leave the credit to be used later or refund the amount to the customer. No refunds. We're happy to get the you know, point of money was owed us 325, 375. Now let him come back to us for for more services. And what's gonna happen now is we're gonna have a credit of 625. And this is similar to what would happen if you wrote out a check to a vendor without paying the bill. If you recall, I said last time, you don't just write out a bill to National Grid for, for, the, for the invoice, you would go to pay vendors. Yeah, credit for the overpayment will remain on his account. So you could print it, okay, fine. I'll ignore the rest of the information for now. And now it shows a negative receivable of 625. Yeah, so that this all ties out. Now, if I would go to vendors, pay bills, we have your Canada's National Grid. So let's say for example, um, Army Magazine, we use that as an example, $250. The way you would pay them is this is a accounts payable. We owe, we owe $250, a liability to our magazine. And we, the way you do it is you have to pay down the liability. So you go to the liability and you pay it down. Another way to do it, and this is, this is a straightforward way of doing it. And QuickBooks will remind you if, you, if you're writing a check to someone who has accounts payable, we remind you to do that. Let me see if there's anything. Okay, so Anonymous was asking if we learned something complex. Uh, I started with the complex thing first and it's possible the menu bar is also complex. So just, no, I sent you my company. It's because we do it all. And it's not your first or second, just take the file that I gave you if you can. And if I would go control W, which is to write a check, and I would, it's just a print, okay? And I'm gonna say to Ami Magazine, it's gonna tell you you have the unpaid bill. Are you writing a check? Work in the pay bills window to connect it correctly. That's the way it should be. And if you go to code of pay bills, it's gonna bring me back to my uh, vendor window. Um, so I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna do one correctly and one incorrectly. So you'll see what happens. So Ami Magazine, that's how you do it. You pay a bill. We did that in the past with Nest Paper. We did it with everything. But for those, since we didn't do this in a while, so I'm showing the correct way we go. That the, the data is 610. The check at the bottom, is, that's the method, Chase. We'll be overdraft, but you know what? We're not worried so much because number one, we have $1,000 to deposit in the bank. Number two, we have to mail out the check. So. You know, the secretary is in today, on Mondays and Wednesdays. We're doing the, the books. So we're gonna prepare the checks and the payments, but we're not worried about bouncing because we're not mail, until we mail it out, it'll be next Monday. And we've already had the deposits. So I'm just gonna go pay select the bills and that's done. So simple. What's uh, pay select the bills. So we paid the vendor. And if we're paying more bills, you pay more bills, close. Ami Magazine doesn't exist anymore. It exists uh, as a company. If you go to vendors, Ami has no more balance anymore. We pay them off. Ami Magazine is zero. 
250. Now, what would happen if we have, um, let's say, take Mach and Yerushalayim, okay? Take Mach and Yerushalayim, I'm going to W, I'm writing a check for $100. Mach and Yerushalayim, $100. And I say, no, I'm writing my check anyway, right? What's going to happen? I'm going to write $100, and the count is probably for, let's just say it's for, But it really is its purchases. That's what it is. Um, let's look at an account. Cost of goods sold. Again, cost of goods sold is as you sell it, it goes out, right? So we so we're gonna put it in the for now. We're just gonna put it in the general cost of goods. Actually, that's not the right way where to do it. We're gonna do it to the liability. Okay, we're gonna do it to our. Let's just say, okay, accounts payable. That's what it is, because we have already the liability. We're paying it to accounts payable. And I'm paying the $100. I'm gonna save and close. It's probably gonna ask me who's the, who's the payee, because if it's accounts payable, you gotta choose an account. Okay, in the case it didn't. So what we did is, right now, Mokhan Yishalayim is zero, because this is the master list. This is which would come up in your, in your, pay, in your uh, reports, we had a bill for Mokhan Yerushalayim for $100, and we paid $100. It's gone at zero. But the bill is still open because we did not pay the bill. Let's go to vendors, pay bills. Uh, Mokhan Yerushalayim is still sitting here, $100. Now, do you going to pay them another $100 and you're going to double pay them? That's not, that's not proper. You see, the way QuickBooks tracks the accounts payable is, you know, there's general liabilities that you have to pay. That's double debits and credits accounts payable is you enter the bill. And the way to get rid of that bill is you pay the bill. You go to the vet, to vendors, vendors drop down pay bills, and, and, and then you pay, the, and you pay off the liability. That's how QuickBooks does. Now, we didn't do that. We did it a different way, which QuickBooks would call incorrect. We just wrote out a check. So in the general scheme of things, there is no, it's a, Inconsistency. There's a machish line here who has a zero balance, but there is a vendor who has this, that, that vendor does have a hundred dollar bill. And this problem is more common than you think. A lot of people don't know. They're so excited. They open the mail, they enter the bills very nice, they have it on their desk, and they just go ahead and start writing out checks to pay the bills. And then you're building with time, you're having a, a big buildup of accounts payable, your reports are not gonna come correct. Because if you look here, for example, let me do one report. Reports, company financial profit um, balance sheet. That's what you would need, you need a balance sheet because that's where accounts payable go. Our accounts payable is 604, right? Let's look in our, in our pay bills. See the bottom at 654 actually. So let's say as of, um, today's day, 610 is 654. So there's $50 not included here. Let's see what, who that is. Because this as of today, let's open up. And we're going to see we have Mokhin Yishalayim. See, over here, Mokhin Yishalayim does have a credit. They have a credit of $100. It's actually, this is a bill and a check for $100. So in this case, it's actually only $50 off. We'll, get, we'll, we'll explain that at another time. Let's look at the cash method. The cash method is going to show us something totally different. So we're not going to look at the cash for now. So in truth, QuickBooks didn't forget about that $100. If you go into the vendor center, you go here, this via credit. You'll care, credit available, $100. And this is what happens. When we wrote the check, it paid off the accounts payable because we didn't attach it with a vendor or with a bill. Because you could have had four bills from Machin Shalayim. Which bill is it supposed to attach it to? It doesn't know. So we know that Machin Shalayim is wiped out. There's no balance. That's, the, that's what you see in the vendors. In the vendors, you see there's nothing left. Right? There's nothing left. But as far as the bills are concerned, the bills are unpaid because you didn't select the bill. And it might, you know, maybe it's an earlier bill that's due, a later bill but the credit is here. So you, this is called misapplied credits. So all you gotta do, right, 
Now I chose this only because I highlighted Melchim and Shalayim. I didn't select the invoice yet, but at least if I, I highlight Melchim, Karas Farim, there's no credits available. I highlight Melchim and Shalayim, there's a credit of $100. And I'm going to select the invoice. Okay, select the invoice and I say set credit. It could have been you're giving a discount, could be giving a credit. In this case, when we're paying the bill now, so basically we're, this is a two-step process. Besides the fact that uh, we get lost, paying vendors, just you pay it once, you pay the vendor, the bill is gone. Here we wrote out a check. We wrote out a check to a vendor. Might have been even a $10,000 payment. And this is at zero. When you go to the bill, you take a double take and say, what? I still have $10,000 owed? And then, yeah, you, you, your heart skips a beat, but you click and it, wow, there's a $10,000 credit. But still, even though you found it, it's just more work. You wrote the check, they have to go back in. You might forget about it. You may not show where the payments are applied. And now I'm going to set the credit over here, set credit. And I'm setting the credit to this bill, right? The bill dated 527. Let's slide it around. It was dated 527. So it was due 10 days later on 6 6. So the, for, the, for the bill dated 527, today on 6 10, I'm going to make the payment. I'm using up the whole $100. It could be sometimes I have a credit, which is more than $100. And the bill is only 100, so I'll only use part of it and I'll have some left over, credit balance. And this, I could have selected, I only want to use, whatever reason, I could have said I want to use only $50. And then I would have still a balance of 50. I could have used 75, you know, um, $72 and I balance of 28. But I'm going to use, in this case, I'm going to use the whole thing, $100. And now, the amount to pay, I'm actually paying, not zero. I'm taking the amount which is due for a hundred with no discount. I'm using a credit of a hundred dollars and I'm paying nothing out of my bank today. Not gonna increase my, my overdraft. The fact that it's 835 is because I already wrote the check. I technically I wrote the check, now I'm just using a credit. So I pay selected bills. And I'm, one more thing to point out, What's the discount? Who am I to decide what discount I'm paying? You know, I had a bill from Con Edison, the Curtis Fireman. Who am I to say I'm, I'm doing a discount, right? I'm going to go on uh, here. Set this go. You might say um, suggest a discount. Maybe uh, I'm bargaining. You know, I'm, I'm asking. I'm, I'm underpaying my bill, and hopefully he'll write it off. But the truth is there are things called, you know, net, um, you know what's it called? Uh, 2%, 10, net 30, which means we discussed this briefly in the beginning that vendors want to guarantee an incentive that their bills get paid. And they say, we'll give you a 2% discount if you pay it in the first 10 days. So the odds are it sits around, it gets lost, it gets buried. If you don't pay it, then fine. After 10 days till 30 days, you pay net 30. You'll pay the full bill by 30 days or net 60. If you really want the customer, you give them 60 days to pay it, but you give them an incentive. So, well, we did, so we did the two things today. We discussed how Pony um, um paid a thousand dollars towards his really three hundred seventy-five bills. So we had to adjust his bill from three to three seventy-five. And we noticed that there's a, a credit that he has by us of six twenty-five. And I demonstrated on the pay bills end the same idea that you could pay a bill the right way through pay vendors, which is the short way. Or you could just write out a check to someone and later on go back to the vendors and set the credit which exists over there. Okay, so that was the first half of the sample case. Now let's go, that's, a, that's what we did through pay checks, we see payments. Now the next part we'll do through the debits and credits, but let's first analyze what's going on here. Um, I'm gonna take a pause here. Does anyone if, see if people have questions that we did until now? Okay, someone's still asking me to, po to post it while I'm reading the code. I'll post it while I am on the class. One second. Mushir, um, back to this one here. Okay. So now you see the password. Um, good. Let's see here. So on 610 today, he walks into the office and his broker tells him, you know what? We need your financials through 531 to finalize your loan. 
you know, you thought it was very quick, but sometimes it's too good to be true. Let's see updated financials at 531. The good news is that as of 531, he didn't, he wasn't overdraft because he didn't pay his employees yet until uh, in, in June. So he won't show all the, that expense. And when you make financials, basically doing a period, so you're making an analysis. Where was my building, well, where was my business holding in 531? Um, a lot of times FY, which is a fiscal year, right? So we have the report at the end of the year. What, that's when you have to do depreciation. You take, you know, all the adjustments have to be done. We have to recognize that even when you buy a computer or a desk, it loses value over time. So even though we don't take the expense in the beginning, as soon as we buy it, as soon as we buy it, it's an asset. A $1,200 uh, copier is an asset. But if expe life expectancy is five years, then we are really losing $240 of value every year for the copier, is, which is why we put on the, that depreciation expense at the end of the year uh, for $240 to 731. But now we realize we have to make financials of 531. So it might sound technical, but this is just obviously learning how to do things. So we have to take five twelfths now of that $240 and recognize that in by 531. So $240 is $20 a month, right? So you have 10 months times 20 is $200. Another two months, so it's $20 a month. So really the first five months of the year, his depreciation expense is $100. And then at the end, the second seven months is 140. Together it's 240. So he would have to adjust the depreciation to recognize depreciation through May. Maybe. Uh, he also sees $71 of supply still on hand. Levy? Office on 6 1. That means at the end of May, he didn't use the, all the office supplies of $177. He only used about $100. And, uh, Levy. $126. Of that, the other seventy-one is still there, so you have to undo the expense. You have to you now you have an asset because when at the end of five thirty-one, he didn't really spend the whole what seven one seventy-seven. He spent one twenty-six, and he has now it's called an asset of office supplies. So you can have an expense of office supplies, and you have an asset of office supplies. Levy now. Levy. Um, I'll pause here for a second before I just, you know, okay, I'll read the rental. The rental Levy. will say $1,500, but he's a little office. He has a little desk and $1,500 might have seemed, seemed excessive. So now you're getting a new piece of information. His office rental is really $500 a month. So when he paid $500, it was, it was either $1,000 for security for two months or you had to prepay two months. So even though we originally did $1,500 as an expense, that's theoretically, yeah, you know, looking at 2020, he's there for three months, he has $1,500 expense. And he would use up that, that $1,500 payment. I mean, it could be the office has a minimum for three months, so he paid the $1,500. But at the end of one month, right, we started in May, he only had an expense of $500. He has a $1,000 asset of prepaid rent. So he has prepaid rent, $1,000. He has $71 of office supplies which is still an asset, and, but he does already have an expense of $100 of depreciation. Okay, so that explains, before we say what we're actually gonna do, I shall let you know. So what's gonna happen now? We're gonna, we're gonna create a debit of an asset, and we're gonna credit an expense. Before, before the, when we made the expense, we made a debit, and we're gonna credit the expense. However, that's good as a 531, but going forward again, we're gonna have rent again. So we have to make a new, when am I gonna to remember to put that $71 back into use as an asset, I mean, as an expense, right? When am I, right now, as of uh, June 1st, I might, or 531, I had a $1,000 uh, rent expense. Second. Hello. No, I, have, I'm sorry, I haven't been hearing for some reason. Should I pause? I could pause right now. Yeah, but also, uh, as you noticed, your screen share. Were you supposed to be sharing screen with no, anybody? No, I'm talking, you know, because people were asking to download the... 
the software and the user password that I gave, which I put here. So I'm just, I'm, no. just, I'm explaining the document that you printed out. All right, hang up the phone and just tell me if you hear me. I do want to speak right now, but tell me that you hear me. Do you, do you hear me now? I hear you through my computer without my headphones. That's, the, that's what it is. So, okay. So. All right, let me just hang up the phone also over here. Okay, so I'm just I'm sorry. Good evening, everybody. Sorry to interrupt. Um, just take two minutes of your time over here. It's nice to see so many of you still here, taking the course, taking it so seriously. I hope you're learning a tremendous amount. Um, we're coming towards the end. Uh, we sent out an email. There's three classes. There's really four classes, including tonight, left to complete the course. Um, we're getting to that point about the certification that we discussed. So I just wanted to talk about the certification in a very general way. We'll send out an email. Uh, we'll, we'll need your responses. So, so bottom line is like this. This course has trained you towards being able to take the certification test and get a certification uh, for your knowledge in QuickBooks. Aside from the, the course, there's again, there's four classes left. There will be, after, the, after we complete it, there will be additional optional classes for those of you that would like to do preparation for the certification test together with Levy. Levy will continue. They'll do like a review and a preparation for the test. We'd like to uh, offer the test, you know, in a few weeks to everyone that feels ready to do it. I just want to give a few details here. Very important for you to know. I'm telling this to you now, and then we'll send an email and we have to clarify things. Number one is like this. We're, this free course is because we're funded by New York State. Okay. So, First thing is that we cannot offer, anyone that doesn't live in New York State, we can't give you a free certification test. Um, I could send you a link to the certification. It costs $150 to take. And you, so you could pay yourself for it and get the certification. That's totally up to you. But anyone that doesn't live in the, you know, the five boroughs, we, we unfortunately with our grant, we're not able to uh, pay for your certification test. Everyone that does live in, in New York, sorry, the whole state of New York, not just the five boroughs, we can pay for it. Um, but the condition is, and really uh, I should have brought this up earlier, we want all the students that have come regularly are the people that we're willing to pay for. If someone hasn't been coming regularly to the course, um, we're not going to, because the funding is, is predicated on attendance of students. So we can only give it to the students that have come to the majority of classes. So for those of you that are watching, it's, it's nice that you're still here and we definitely can you know, arrange that. So we, what we want to know who is ready to take the test. So we're, bottom line, we're going to be sending out an email tomorrow. Okay. Um, please respond. If you are interested in taking this certification test, which I, I hope you are. I mean, Levy's been doing an amazing job. And again, we will do additional classes, test prep, and then we will send you, you know, for those of you that are ready to take it, we'll send you a, a special link for you to log in to take the test. It's a, it's not a very long test. It takes about an hour and a half. We've done it before in the past. Uh, we can't even have Levy be, available via Zoom. If you have questions, again, we can't answer your test questions, but if you have questions that you need clarification on, you know, we're here. Our goal, this was our goal with this test, to be able to take you to the point where you could take this test and get that certification, and that's going to be our greatest satisfaction. So again, just to summarize, for the, everyone could take the test. If you live out of state, it costs $150 to take the test. If you live in New York State, we will pay for it, uh, as long as you've been coming to the classes regularly. That's our condition. I should have probably announced this a few weeks ago. Didn't realize it was going to be such a drop off in the amount of students. But any students that have been coming regularly, we will happily cover the expense of your certification test. So please, tomorrow, look out for the email. We'd like to know exactly, we need to know exactly who would be willing to take the test. And so again, there's, aside from tonight, there's four classes left to complete, including tonight. So three more classes to go. Then we will do additional classes certification prep. And uh, I'm hoping that all 33 of you that are here right now and anyone that might have missed but has been coming regularly, we'd love to see all of you become certified and uh, gain a meaningful parnasa emir Hashem. And so once again, nice to see all of you and looking forward to being in touch via email. Levy, uh, the floor is all yours again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everyone have a good evening. Does Do you have any here? questions for me about the certification? Once that email goes out tomorrow, you could send me all your questions. We'll respond to all your questions, anything you have uh, with regard to that. I'm not going to address it right now. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Nice to see all of you. Okay. Um, where are we over here? So, <clears throat> I talked with my speaker.
Okay, I think my mic, mic is working better now. Second. Okay, let's see, is this working better now? Um, so we said that QuickBooks lets you make the double adjustment at the same time. That means I go back, I can make a journal entry, which is, gonna, which is going to uh, recognize that uh, not all $1,500 was a rent expense. So I'm taking $1,000 of that expense and make a credit Right, I can make a credit that was an expense, it's an asset. Um, so the, obviously the credit will be a get, not expense and the debit will be prepaid rent, that's the asset. But then you, what's called, you make a reversing entry, which starts off the next um, financial period, which will be the beginning of June, to undo what I just did. It's gonna put back the thousand dollar expense and undo my asset right away. That way, th this double journal entry, one day apart, gives me the opportunity to have financials through 531 showing the, you know, the, the real expense out of that day, which is only $500 rent, only $126 of supplies. At the same time, if I go one day later, I will see now that there's $1,000 of expense and I'll see the other $71 of supplies of expense. So ultimately throughout the year, it, the, the, the end result is the same, but a lot of accounting or bookkeeping is also, because accounting needs the, the information of bookkeeping, is predicated on, the on timing. It's all about the timing, right? The difference of having a, an extra child born on, on, on the December 31st means that it could be another $2,000 tax savings on the tax bill. Uh, or for earning the credit, it could be uh, even more of a, of a refund. It's all about one day. It could be even one, uh, one hour, the difference of, of 11.30 p.m. or uh, of December 31, and uh, one minute after uh, on the, the first minute of 12.01 on January 1st. <clears throat> so that, that is, that is a, a, um, a these are called adjusting entries, and then there's reversing entries, which in the accountant version, you're gonna see not has a reversing um, component to it right away. So let's see over here, if we go to company and general journal entries. By the way, also an accountant dropdown, you could find make general journal entries. And the accountant dropdown has send general journal entries. Because a lot of times these journal entries are, are a little complex for the regular bookkeeper. So the accountant makes the general journal entries in the accountant file, right? You send accountant the, a copy of the file of QBA to look at. He could create general journal entries. Then he could send those general journal entries as a file to the, customer, to the client. And we discussed last time that if you go file, utilities, and import, Import general journal entries, right? That's what they did right on Monday. That's what uh, clients will do when they don't know how to do all those entries. If uh, if those all those debits and credits for putting the closing 
of the house and on the books. It's complicated. The accountant could make the entry and send it over to the client. Um, Turn of the client could send them the whole QuickBooks file, the client could edit it and send it back and overwrite the file. But people don't want all the information flying around, maybe. So you could just send those general, general entries. But in the customers, um, in the company, there's the make general, general entries. It's not really send because why would you send general entries to an accountant? The same way, if, if you know how to do it, you gave him the accountant file, he has it in it, the QBA file. So the sending the general entries is really an option which the accountant would send to the client. Anyway, we are, we are not the accountants right now. Right now we are the company people, we're the quick in the company. So let's figure out what we're really doing. So look at general original entry. In the past, we just debits and credits. But if you look at a moment on the top, you see what's called reverse. This reverse is undoing what we will do. So let's pick example. What's the date is M minus, right? M is the month. Minus brings us to 531. Okay. So M minus, I'm going to go make a few entries. I'm going to make, um, these are called, this is really adjusting entries. That's what they are. We are adjusting what has to be done for the end of the period. There are entries which are not adjusting entries, right? What we did to do a closing is not called adjusting entries. That is a regular debit and credit in the journal, uh, recognizing that my equity went up because I put in $20,000, my liability went up because I borrowed $180,000 and against that I have an asset, a debit that is $200,000. Those are not adjusting entries. Adjusting entries are what we're doing now to recognize at the end of the period, whether it's depreciation expense, whether it's depreciation expense, so we're adjusting for that period of time, whether it's um, undoing uh, expense of supplies and rent, those are adjusting. And those adjusting entries need the reversing entries, not the regular entries. So if you undo it, then you never had anything. So we have, in this case, Right? If, you, if you make an uh, entries and you undo it, it's where you are where you began. In this case, we already have the $1,500 rent. We're going to make an adjusting entry to take out 1000 and in reverse to put back the 1000 one day later. So we're going to be back to where we were in the, in the general year, but for the period, the difference of 531 and 61, and, and we'll be able to make those adjustments. So let's see what we're doing here. We're doing number one the $71. So we're going to do the um, supplies. Since we have office supplies, I'll just put general supplies and that's going to be an asset account. Okay. Set up an asset of supplies. It's not a fixed asset because it's not a major purchase, but it's an asset nonetheless. It's another current asset because it can be sold. And it says here, there you go. Prepaid expenses. Wow, see, this is what this now you understand what you this is what it's done for. If I prepay my rent a thousand dollars, I'm it's an asset, it's not the, we technically if I paid ten thousand twelve thousand dollars in January for the year and I wouldn't need to make a report, so I'll take the expense in January twelve thousand dollars until the following January, there's no more rent payments. But when you have to make a, a, let's say a quarterly report or any time report, then you got to make those adjusting and entries and you already have to make an account for prepaid expense. Now, there's the other method where people put everything as prepaid and month by month, they just wipe off a hundred, uh, uh, one month worth of expenses, right? You might've put in 500 rent and a thousand dollars an asset. And now you want to come and take off another $500 for June. So we're doing the way we did it before. We're sticking with one method now. Continue, so supplies is an asset, right? So other current asset, and I'm debiting the asset $71, and I'm gonna credit, right? It knows it better than I do, it has to match. Every debit equals a credit. And office supplies is a credit expense which reduces the expense. Then again, we have to take $1,000 out of rent, so we'll do prepaid. We're gonna call it what they call the prepaid, Rent, prepaid rent debit. It's also another current asset. Same thing, employee cash advances. Sometimes employee asks you to give the money against their next check. 
the assignment expense, it's a loan. You gave him the money. Now, why the loan means you could collect it, but you have security. You have his next check again, you know, from which to, to get your money back. Okay, we're taking off, saving clothes. Thousand dollars is a prepaid rent, and we're taking this off of rent of expense. So now I'm going to pause over here, saving close, and let's look at our PL. Our PL, actually, we're in the balance sheet, so let's see. Balance sheet shows we're at June 10. Here we go prepaid rent $1,000 and supply $71. It's right there. Yes, it works. Let's go for a second back to the PL uh, reports. Profit and loss standard as of today. Um, not six one, we gotta go back to a Y, which is the year. Let's look at our rent expense. Our rent expense is only $500. And our office supplies is only 106. Yes, not 120, so it's 106. Right, 177 minus 71 is 106. Okay. And I'm going to go back into it. Right, this is a through 610. And you're going to see how it changes. It's going to change back to where it was. I'm going to go back, double click. I told you anytime you get a thread, I'm going to go back into the journal entry, double click. And again, double click, you're back into the journal entry. And now I'm going to do reverse, right? We said we have to do reverse and watch the date. Here's 531. You go reverse, show 61. And it goes reversal of GJE, which is general journal entry. And it puts back, it, it removes, it credits the supplies, which is the asset, and it puts back the office supplies expense. It credits the prepaid rent of $1,000, and it gives you the, the rent expense back of a thousand dollars. And I'm gonna save and close. Now, um, this is what really all companies have to do regarding payroll. When you have your payroll um, done every bi-weekly and you have a big company, so your payroll might've been, been on the, let's say December 22nd was the last check. People work for another week and you're not gonna give a check until January 7th or January 5th. You, you want to recognize what is your real uh, payroll expense for the year. Whether or not you gave the check to the employee, you're not getting the whole two week expense in the following year. So you make this adjusting entry, you make a payroll expense of, um, right, we know it's payroll expenses of that week of payroll. So you get, it, you get the expense in for the year and then you reverse the entry for the following year. So. You have, you have what's called a negative expense of a week. So like this, when you make the check a week into the year with a value of two weeks, you're only recognizing in this year one week of um, a payroll expense. You're giving a check for two weeks, but one week is, the neg is, is to offset the negative because you already took it last year. And the second week is, is included in the check. So that is, um, if you look here now, if you look in the period of January 1st through 610, you will see the 177 office supply. You will see the rent expense of 1500. So throughout the year, it, it, it nets out. But if I go N minus, and I want to know what happened on 531, their rent expense is only 500 and office supplies are 106. This is, this is a beautiful thing that um, QuickBooks does for us that journal entry with that reversing. So if I just go one day more, a plus one day more, well, and I go press tab, all of a sudden it recognizes the full rent expense and the full office supply expense for the year. So the bank might want a financial for 531, but we want to have the whole year and it doesn't mess anything up. If I go back to the balance sheet, it'll be the same thing. 610, it shows me there's no more asset anymore because we did reversing entry, it's gone. If I go and minus, then I have an asset of prepaid rent 1,071. I'm gonna take a pause over here and look to see people's questions. This is a little more advanced and obviously 
all the time with the general journals, we never did reversing because this is a step above. You always take everything further. So those are the debits and credits. We did the, we did the sample case seven. And let me see questions you have over here. Okay, I don't see any questions right now. I see one question back at 853. Um, this is for, for, for Mati who wants to know what's the wrong way to pay my credential line. The wrong way to, uh, we said is if you go write a check, control W, write a check to Con Edison, and it's going to tell you that you have a bill. If you already enter the bill, then don't write the check. Go to pay bills and pay it. But if you would write the bill, if you would write the check anyway, right? So then you would have to set a credit against that because even though QuickBooks um sees in the vendor center that the bill over here is paid in the vendor center the bill will be paid off but in the pay bills right I, okay this is what's called the count, count payable section so even though with regards to count payables ultimately you paid the guy so it's done but as far as the bill section each individual bill that didn't apply that payment to any particular bill so you have to go ahead and do a second step that's why i say why do extra work, extra steps when it's unnecessary? And, but again, you might come into the office and you'll see unapplied credits and you should do that and clear it out. You just discuss with, uh, with the person. Well, and, and, you know, and you should know something. You know, um, this is not the, the place to discuss, you know, the place of fraud or anything, but you can have a, a person, a company who writes a check to Con Edison, so, when you look at the at, at the accounts payable, it's gone. We don't owe uh, Con Edison any money at 328, but he never paid the bill because he wrote it out to his own his, to his own Con Edison. So on a superficial level, Con Edison is not owed any money. A check went out to Con Edison, they could clear the bank, but the bill is unpaid because it never went to pay the bill of the company, but to pay the person's bill. Okay, so right now we have $554 of bills left open. That's what counts payable should be on the balance sheet. Counts payable um, shows here 954. Um, let's go plus, let's see what happened here. Why is it counts payable? A second vendor, pay bills. Uh, why is it payable in my uh, 954? It's going from previous period. Let's see who's unpaid here. No, unpaid. It's for today. No, maybe go because it's for June 1st. And shows 604 as of today. Okay, the reason why the counts payable is $50 extra is if you recall, similar, you have the $50, which is item receipt. So QuickBooks knows we have to pay the bill of $50. So total, our counts payable is 604. Because we did not enter the bill yet, that's why bills are only five vendors um, pay bills. Okay, so pay bills is 554 because when we enter the bill against what we received for $50, we will have the pay bills 604. But the accounts payable report knows that we owe $50, even though, despite the fact there's no bill. So, again, these are things which you know, you come to time, you realize the differences between the pay bill center and the accounts payable center, and the same thing on the accounts receivable end. 
if you look here in the, in the balance sheet you have here, this here it does match. You have um, on the cruel basis, accounts receivable, I have 1867. And if I look for the year, okay. You know, theoretically, we have a negative 625, remember, from Polonia Money because he overpaid us. So that's a negative on his account, but that's not receivables. As far as receivables are concerned, we still need to collect another 1867. Okay. Um, I hope you, I hope, please don't hesitate again. If you need clarification on something, please let me know. I cannot guess what is in your mind. Yeah, uh, accounts payable is 604. That is correct as of today. Yes, it's 604. And the reason why the vendors pay bills is 554 is because we still have to create a bill of $50 against something which is really due to be paid. And I was asking again the reverse. So the reverse undoes a temporary adjustment. That's what it does. We make an adjustment to take out. And you notice that just like it makes the reverse, it adds one day because QuickBooks knows what the purpose is. The purpose is to recognize that at 531, oh, we didn't do the $100 depreciation. That no reminded me, but we have to do that also. So let's go back into, let's do this uh, the right way. Let's go to, and minus, that's how we get the thread. We can go into the asset of uh, prepaid rent, right? Uh, the only day you'll catch the asset is on 531. If you would go to, for example, um, let's go one day minus again, five, uh, 530, there is no asset. If you go to 62, um, 61, there is no asset. But if you go one day minus to 531, that asset is there at $1,071. Because it's only there for that day. It's there for the day you made the entry. And the reverse puts, takes away the asset and puts it back into expense. And we said we have to do here, well, let's see, it's interesting because we're doing the, we're editing a general journal when there's already a reverse against it. Let's see how it goes. So I'm going here. See, we have here journal entry number three was the adjustment for the supplies and for the prepaid rent. If I go next is three R, which is three reverse. Yeah, good. Now let me go back and add do the depreciation issue, which is I'm gonna debit. I'm gonna debit um, copier, uh, which is furniture, right? Furniture and equipment. I'm gonna give it back. $140, and I'm gonna credit the expense. I'm not, that's, I'm, I already took the depreciation. Actually, you know what? No, we'll do it the way you, you would do it anyway. We did depreciation of $100 today at 531, and we are going against the furniture $100, right? So we're gonna recognize $100 depreciation today, and theoretically, in the year, you might think it's total 340 because it took 100 on 531, and it's 240 and 1231. <coughs> but it's not the case because when we do the reversing entry, it's going to put a negative expense of $100, which is basically putting the credit back. So, yeah, as of 531, there's an expense of 100. There's a credit of 100 on June 1st. And if you take, if you look at June 1st, Altogether, you still have the same, you, you have a zero. You would have a zero expense on June 1st. Let's, let's demonstrate that. Let's save and close. You change the action, sure. So we have here now, let's go back to our PL, um, profit and loss. Going to profit and loss, I see here on 6 1. Is there depreciation expense? Yes, it has a it has depreciation expense of six one. It has it there on five thirty one of hundred dollars. If I go one day minus again, 
right? One day minus, it's not there. Okay, so you think I'm wrong, right? We, have, we don't have depreciation 530, but you have it on 531, which is the day we made the entry. And we also have it on 61. And we also have it on 62. And the answer is because the reversing entry was not put in. It doesn't automatically adjust. This is a manual thing you have to do. So if you get in all your adjustments in, then you do your reversing entry. So if I open up my, my first entry, right, there's three and three R. I double click on three. I have three entries. I have the supplies, I have the prepaid rent, and depreciation. If I, have, if I go into the reversing, because it's manual, they don't know to reverse the entry just because I, I changed something. It's only two entries. So one way to do it, and is depending on if you, how many entries you have, because you could have many types of assets that you have to make. You might just delete this reversal and then reverse the other entry, right? You could just go delete. I'm gonna delete this transaction. Actually, um, delete. Okay, it's gone. Now we have, um, where's number three? Look at the date, okay, we got here, number three. And now I'll do reverse. If I do reverse now, it does all three things together. Now I'll show you when I go, what I do happens in the report. I go back to the report and profits and loss, and you'll see depreciation expense is zero on 6.2. See, minus 6.1 is zero, minus again, you have the 100 minus again, it's the date is zero. So that's what it does. It puts in the depreciation expense for, now, now this is one case where you see when there's a zero line item, it, it, it comes up, it shows you the zero. Usually when there's nothing in that, cat, in that account, it just won't even show it on the report. Because as a 531, it wants to show us $100 expense, and then six one, it's showing zero expense. Therefore, it will um, show the line item. If I go R for year, then I'll show the whole 240 expense. That is on the P and L side. And let's go to the to the to the balance sheet. And then we'll we'll uh, if you have questions, I'll I'll take your questions, or we'll we'll do some of the menu items. Let's see here on. Um, Balance sheet, balance sheet. If I would look here on copier in 531, my total asset, this is assets for furniture, is 1979. Furniture equipment is 1979. If I go one day earlier, minus, it's 2079. Because the depreciation is a, as a, as it goes against the furniture and equipment. Now the truth is this is not really the way it's supposed to be done. You don't do depreciation against the, the actual equipment because the physical equipment is here. We discussed to do what's called accumulated depreciation. You will take a depreciation expense and you will have an accumulated depreciation against it. Um, for the next class. So again, 530 is 2079, 531 is 1979 and 61 will be again, 2079 because we took the expense out. Um, the Schlemus Union. Let's go back into the general entry and see if we could take the furniture and equipment. Is there a, yeah, there is a cumulative depreciation. That's what you're supposed to use. So I'm going to save it and close it. And I'm going to go manually and make that change in the reversing entry also. It has to match. We're putting it back into the accumulated depreciation. And this is what I explained in, the, in one of the earlier classes. Go back to balance sheet. You have a 2079, but on, if you go on 531, you will have a negative 100, it's called accumulated depreciation, and 2079. When the cap, so at the end of the year, if I go R, should be the same thing. It, sh it should be, and it is. It's an accumulated depreciation of 240, and furniture and equipment of 2079. We have our house because we made a closing of 202. And when we get rid of the equipment, then you get rid of both entries. You take away a depreciation and you take away the furniture and equipment. 
Okay, that's it for the debits and the credits. That's it for the case example. I did say we want to do a comparison to last year. So if I'm here right now, let's get that over with and then we'll go over to the menu. So on the P&L profit and loss, I'll just get the feet wet today and we'll get involved next week. You just go to what's called customized report. Okay, we have here the whole year, January to December, 2020. Customize report, and we're gonna to go to add sub column for previous year. So change of dollar, change of period. That's all there is to it. To make a comparison, we have this year, we wanna see what is the previous year, what is a dollar and the percentage of change. I'll pause here for you to do that on your, on your computers and your files and I press okay. And now you'll see, we have this year, tons of income, 3,000. Last year, we only made $70. It's a difference of 3470 3, and it's a change of 5,000% or 50 times as much. Okay, that is the end of number six. I'm gonna wait for you to whoever wants to test it on their self, and then we'll go over to the edits, the view, and about 20 minutes or so from now, we will go over to Q&A. Close customer payment page. How do you call it? The, there's two X's, the top X at the back, and it will close you out of the, of the whole um, software. If you go to the bottom X, it closes the windows. It might ask you to modify the settings, press no. You could also, if you have a bunch of windows open, just go close window, window drop down, close all. Window close all, and it'll close all the many, many windows we have open. It's gonna do its job of closing it down. until we get stuck by a question wants to ask you and then say, should I do this or do that? I can press cancel. So now I only have like one or two, three, a few windows open. Okay, that answers how you close customer payment page. You X out. Notice that's for, uh, it's for Rachel 19. And then so again, accumulated depreciation 240 only exists on, on from the end of the period and on. So only on uh, December 31st, that's a cumulative depreciation. Or if I go on 531, which is again, um, today and minus, you'll see $100 cumulative depreciation. Okay, that's uh, Mr. Gold. Um, anonymous was, well, how do we do depreciation expense? Again, depreciation expense exists in the chart of accounts. Accumulated depreciation exists in the chart of accounts. So you debit the expense and you credit the contra asset. That's what it is. It's a accumulated depreciation. If, if the asset itself is furniture and equipment in a positive number, the contra asset, which is against it, right? And as time goes on, Accumulated depreciation grows and grows until it gets as equals furniture and equipment. It cannot go more. You cannot have more depreciation than the item itself. So it's a debit and a credit. And we know how to make general general entries. And we've come a long way from the first and second class when everyone was, no, uh, people were asking, when are we gonna get it? Hopefully by now we get it. If not, we have another few classes to do it. So we, like I said, um, I think I answered the next question already while Michael, I'm talking. And the reverse is that reverse button. And I said, you only use those reverses if it's an adjusting entry. So when you recognize yourself, when I'm gonna put a, when I'm buying a house and I'm putting down my $20,000 and I'm getting the loan, it's not an adjusting entry. That is just stating a, a business transaction that doesn't go to the bank. I gave my money straight to the broker or to the, the, the attorney, the attorney, and, and such. So that's the general journal entries that we put in. Depreciation expense could be tagged as considered uh, adjusting entry. And, and actually, depreciation, depreciation expense in itself might not be adjusting. It's probably not adjusting, but 
but uh, for purposes of 531, it is adjusting. But definitely the, the, the supplies and the rent were adjusting entries at this time, because that's what we need to do. If we put it all as an expense, you got to adjust it for an asset. Um, people, uh, people ask me, you can use my QuickBooks from now on. Uh, we can always do another payroll session or uh, a little bit, and you'll have a review and payroll. You actually have it working. Now, if you go to company homepage, hopefully you should be able to see uh, pay employees, pay liabilities. Hopefully you'll be able to see in the employees a whole big section over here with many, many more options. And you could pay, you could actually pay employees. And if you pay, pay employees, it's going to bring you up the, the people, you know, Mrs. Fine was a secretary, Fishbine, they'll probably do a check next week. So we can do that next week when we have to pay employees again. Also from now on, I'll be reviewing your QuickBooks. Okay, that's that. Again, the purpose of doing reverse is not to take, we can't take a double expense, right? So let's say for example, depreciation expense. If I took $100 depreciation and 531, but I already have depreciation of 240 at the end of the year. So I want to undo the $100 expense for 6-1. Alternatively, okay, I explained before, I want to recognize the fact of this year. So if I have, um, I have uh, rent, which let's say it was the other way around. Let's say I had, I put, I put in $500. Um, for rent, and I paid a thousand dollars of security. It goes by a month. I will, will be a simple debit and credit. I will credit my security five hundred dollars, and I will debit my rent expense, and it's done. I took off my asset and I put it to expense. But in the case of when you first make an expense of it, and and this will also be true if you didn't make the payment. So you want to make you want to recognize the. In this case, we actually paid the 177. But in the case of uh, the Tunes paper, so we paid the 177 and we made the expense of 177, but it wasn't really all used up. So I want to make an asset for, the, for that day of $71. But, how, but it, it will be used up in the next period. And if I'm not going to have anything in the books. I'm going to lose a potential expense. If I wouldn't do the reverse, so what happened? I paid 177 of supplies. I took away the expense of 71. So now my expense was only 106. I will use the supplies and I will lose the $71 expense. So that's why we need the reversing entry to put back the expense. I believe that uh, hopefully by explaining it in different ways. I'll go home. Okay, so that's for anonymous. The seventy dollars from five issue is on the customer's report. Please take a look again, and make sure that you're looking at the pay period. The you're looking at the whole year, and you added the count. Okay. Mm hmm. Fine. So we did six. Now we're going to go over to edit. We go to the menu sections. Okay. File drop down. Let's go to, okay, we, we did file already last, we did now we do edit, view and windows. So edit, edit, there are two types of edits. You can edit preferences, edit account. When do you edit account? When you're in the chart of accounts. If you go control A and you're in chart of accounts, edit will show you different things which are fitting for the screen. Okay, so I could, I could copy an account if I, want to, if I don't want to use the same thing, if I want to edit an account, I can edit, uh, it's not Chase. Uh, I realized that uh, I thought it was Chase and I realized it was always City, whatever it is, this is how you edit your account. Edit, I could delete account. Why would I want to delete it? Because maybe I created an account and it didn't belong there. You can make accounts inactive, right? Um, let's say it's very cluttered and, and I, I'm not, I decide I'm not using 
MR and TLS anymore as one-time shot. I go right click and I go make account inactive and it's gonna disappear. You're not gonna have it anymore. But MR still exists in inventory. How can I have it in inventory but not in a cost of goods? Well, if I didn't make a mistake, I would just go back to account on the bottom, account. And I say, here it says, um, actually, when I first have to go to, let's see, I'll close this out. One second, this one goes into my way on my screen. Okay, got it this idea. So, I'm trying to get rid of some of these. Okay, if I if I want to account, I want to see this goes show inactive accounts, right? Show inactive accounts, it's MRs back here, and then I could go and make account active again, and it's here again. And I go okay, so that's basically tweaking. If you want to make accounts inactive, you might also have customers. And you have the same thing, customers. You can make customers inactive. Um, customers, um, I click on customers, I go right click. Um, delete, you can delete a customer, you can make, make a customer inactive. We'll discuss them between a customer and a job at, in, in a different class. If I want to make him inactive, I don't want to see him again. If he doesn't exist in my thing, I deleted him for a reason. Okay, so we're back here in edit. Now it's going to show edit customers because this was appropriate for here, but we were before in accounts. Let's go back to accounts, edit, account, account, account. Okay, we did everything for here. Use register. It's going to give me a register for that. Only asset liability and capital accounts have registers, which basically means the permanent accounts, right? Assets equals liability and owner's equity. Equity is capital. You got it in one sentence. My, what, what is equity? Whatever capital I have in the company. And everything else is temporary accounts, so they don't keep a register. It's just an expense and it comes and it goes. I'll click on Chase and I say edit and use register or control R. And I got, we got another, uh, I'll bring it to the bank. So the, another way to get to the bank is not just by going to banking and use register, right? is by going control A, control R. Control A, control R gets me there. That's a quicker way of going there. And last but not least, we have edit preferences, which opens up many, many items. I see over here. So let me take um, two of them for now, the accounting one and the general. Okay, we try to do everything piecemeal. Accounting, what do we have in accounting? So my preference is nothing. Actually, there's one thing, you can autofill memo in general journal entry. We'll make general journals and you use the same expense another time. Uh, you do the same entry, it will put in the memo for that it recognized. We will uh, demonstrate that in a moment. Company preferences. Okay, someone asked me before that they, they have account numbers. This is use account numbers. What happens when I use account numbers? All of a sudden, my chart of accounts has numbers on the left side. That's another way of recognizing it because it's not alpha alphabetized, right? It, it, the way chart of accounts works is you have assets start off, and assets could be account receivables, could be bank. Then you go to liabilities, right? You go from bank, which is all different types of assets, then you go down to payable credit cards or liabilities. And that's a new ABC. And then you go to equity is another member's equity. And then you have cost of goods. You have expenses, another ABC. So you don't have something going alphabetized. 
So a way of compensating for that, some companies use account numbers and they say, okay, everything that starts with a one is assets. Everything that starts with a two is liabilities. Starts with three is equity. Go one, two, three, right? So then you can have sub, you can have, uh, let's say uh, 11,000, or you can have 11,000, you can have sub, so you get a bunch of zeros, so you can have sub account receivables, you can have different accounts, you can have under, under um, accounts payable, you can have credit cards, that's not a liability, but accounts payable, uh, that's generic, is, is number two. Everything starts with three is equity, right? Members draw, they just threw in 30,000, 700, 3,200, because this is inequity itself. There are different types of things that offset equity. Now, income is number four, right? Sales, why they took 47,900 for whatever reason. This is in their chart of accounts. You see, we started this particular company, but if you would have other companies, they would have designated sales, other numbers, like maybe it would have been 4,500, maybe it would have been 40,000 would have been sales, but they, created different charts of accounts of different companies. I'd always said a cost of goods is a good expense because, because um, it, it's, it's associated with an income. It's not potential income, but it's real income. We, until you sell the cost of goods, it's an asset, it's, it's inventory. When we make the exchange, we take out inventory, it becomes cost of goods. So cost of goods, obviously we want it to be, you know, it'd be competitive, we want to buy items as cheap as possible, but the expense is automatically means you've got a revenue for that. As opposed to advertising promotion is number six, because it's, it's a step down. It brings income, but you could advertise and get no income, right? So that's one level. Then you have the other expenses, which bring you to already, uh, which would be re really seven. That's you know, overhead, you know, you don't even have it here, but uh, seven could be, you know, just salaries that are dead weight. It doesn't bring income, but it's necessary for the company. And then 8,000 estimate me account, 80,000, whatever you don't have a question, you put them as an accountant, purchase order. Okay. So now we did uh, the preference of adding accounts, numbers. I'll go back at preferences. I'm going to take out the account numbers. Okay. Now, by the way, we, we were doing everything. We said you have to have accounts. And that's the default. The default is that uh, you don't need account numbers. It's, it's, it's more cluttering. And you do need accounts, but you could tell QuickBooks, no, I want to have account numbers and I don't want accounts. But that's stupid because as I told you, what's going to happen, the whole point of, of accounts is to give me a PL, right? If I go to my, my profit and loss, I'm gonna have a report of the year, right? If I go for, um, okay, sh I go shift tab, will get me back. And I go Y, and then I go tab and it, go, go Y, beginning of the year, and R. Look at this, I, all these, these are all accounts. The advertising, the appreciation meals, and, and everything I have, uh, payroll expense, means several uh, paychecks and, uh, what, what office supply, uh, what's, uh, let's see, uh, advertising promotion is one thing, but utilities are several items. So if I would not create my accounts, I would just make expenses and it'll be a no name account. Everything, everything will be together in the same place. I'll have to start figuring out what's going on here. That's, I, I can't imagine why someone would not want to have the accounts. You might not be sure, so I'll at least put uh, the ones you don't know and ask my accountant to verify, but the rest, give what you can as it comes in. And, and also she gives you the option, if, if you use numbers, you can have lower sub accounts if you want, at lower sub accounts only, uh, okay, uh, that's going on. Then it's classes. Class is use class tracking. And again, you could prompt for, Every time you do it, you want to have the class or not. And the default is, if you turned on class tracking that you want it, then it will make you the same way it asks you to put an account, it doesn't let you go further. It's gonna make you put in a class. Class is the way of filtering expenses and income by location. So right now we have one advertisement of 250,000 Amy Magazine, 
and that could be for one location, but you could have different advertisement expenses, some advertising costs from different, like different vendors. This vendor is local to this community. So I'm advertising, for example, in the, in the view or in, 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 in Torah times, this is to, to, to target one class of clients. And that's my advertising expense. And when I get my, my, my income for at location, if I have an office, I will know that income came from that location. And if I'm doing it in, um, you know, in the, in the, the five towns uh, paper or whatever it will be. So you would, if I turn on class tracking, uh, as I just did now, we don't have really class, but you go now, let's say into, uh, go back to a vendor and you go to an expense, get Con Edison, which office? Where's this bill for? Now we have a new, ta a new line called class, but we have no class, we have to create classes. But that's the idea of when you, you also make reports, I'll show you the classes, that's what class is about. Okay, what, other, what else do we have here um, that'll be useful? I'm trying to give you useful information. Automatically assign a general journey entry number, right? You wanna be able to fetch it from another, and that's what differentiate one general journal entry from the another, another by number, not just by date that we saw. Okay, the default is uh, when you are doing a transaction more than 90 days in the past, they'll give you a warning. More than 30 days in the future, they'll give you a warning. You can remove these. Um, as an accountant office, I usually take them off because just the extra click and extra annoyance every time I'm doing transactions. I'm entering a, a, a customer once to have uh, the pa you know that put in that data from half a year ago, and uh, put in all the information. And every nine, every every second, I'm going to get a click. Oh, it's nine days behind you. Sure, you want to do it? Okay, fine. Um, I'm preparing him payroll checks, so I'm I'm preparing the checks for the quarter, so we can have all the checks on the computer. Uh, unless there's an adjustment, and he tells you about it, we assume this is done. And, can, and we do all the taxes for the, for the person. And once I'm, the first month I'm fine, but for month two and three, it's gonna give me questions. Are you sure? Are you sure you wanna make the check? So you could take it off, but the, if you're a secretary in an office, odds are your boss, once you have, you have it there, there's no reason why you should be going back three months in a regular case. You know, you should be current within a couple of weeks. Okay, so that is for the accounting Manual. Now you have in general. <clears throat> Let's go to my preferences first. And here you have it gets more busy. Um, we can have pressing enter between. Uh, we do tabs because of press enter. We'll get you from between fields. Um, automatically open drop down list for typing. That's very good. We just type in one or two letters. I type in the E and it already fills an essence because it knows there's only one E. Otherwise, I have to um, type out you know, the, whole, the whole word. Beep when recording transaction. This is where you could finally get rid of all those annoying beeps that you may have had. Or if you like it or you didn't have, you can put it back in. Um, if you edit the transaction, you go out of it. Or it warns you if you sure want to save it. The assumption is you're creating new transactions. It doesn't ask you if you want to save it. It just saves it. But if you go into a transaction, maybe you wanted to look at something, and you opened it up by mistake, you will change something, and you'll, 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 and it's wrong. So it's going to ask you that question, make sure that you really do that change consciously. Um, there are one time messages always that you come into a software, and you could, you might have a mistake, said, okay, you know what, I don't know interested anymore, but then you realize that it gives you useful information. You want to bring back those one-time messages. Turn off pop-up messages for products and services. I don't know why <laughs> their default is that they don't check it off because they want to offer you services that they can charge you for. So this is where you come to general and just turn off the pop-up messages for products and services. They'll offer you to print your checks. They'll offer you to do your payroll services. They'll offer you to do many things. They even offer you to do shipping for you. Okay. Uh, we'll do two, uh, just we'll finish these the two more things here. If you delete a transaction or unused item list, I warn you. Okay, automatically call inf uh, information. There are two ways that you can undo it, but the default is there. There are two parts to this. If you want to remember 
Chan Edison, right? So if I, um, I enter a bill, for example, for Chan Edison, and we know it's electric, right? It's a vendor. So by itself, it's gonna know when I'm entering a bill, it's gonna put that the account is an electric expense, right? That it does based on past entries. But it's possible that you have, that most of your items are not just the same account, but it's reruns and they're automatic and they're same transactions. In that case, you'd want it to automatically recall the last transaction for this name. Instead of you wear a check, let's say you want to put in uh, your car lease. It's every month is the same. Not only it's auto expense, it's the exact same amount. You might want to have that your QuickBooks should not, should not only pre-fill accounts, but it will recall the whole transaction. And you put that in and it'll do it. And the cases where it's not, no problem, no harm done. The accounts will be there anyway. You'll just edit the dollar value. So in the, even the chance where it's say 20% of the time you have recurring, you know, you have the same cell phone bill, flat rate, no overcharges. You have national grid, you're on a fixed payment plan, level billing. So you're writing out the checks. So then you could have um, automatically recall last transaction for this name. And then when you write the check, for example, so now um, I'm gonna enter a bill vendor, for example, vendor, enter bill for Con Edison, not only it's gonna give account, but it's gonna give, which is here on the bottom, it's even gonna show me the amount due. It knows that, it's that smart. And where in the case I only had the account, so it would give me the electric, but it wouldn't know that amount. Okay, so we, we, we managed to accomplish, again, not um, most of what we set out to do today, in detail, we act, I did some other things which weren't really on the list. So we did this example case, we did p &L. we did edit account, we did some of the preferences. We'll do it little by little because otherwise you really get lost. There's so much, there's a quick book, there's so much to do. Um, this is, we're getting ourselves wet, uh, our feet wet. And um, one thing to point out over here, I have, if you look at your windows, windows basically just tell you the windows that are open. And this is in every word you could, uh, you could tile them vertically, which will align them up. Um, well, well, data change for everything because it is a kind of symbol. So I'm lining them up, you know, from top to bottom. I could uh, cascade it, which puts it out in a, one top of the other. I could see it, look at them. And view actually asks you, you know, do you want to know what's your open windows list? Why would I go to view to see my open windows list on the side? I could just go to window. Like I said, QuickBooks gives you multiples of different things. We already learned you can do things multiple times. All right, I'm gonna close all. Oh, we'll go with the Q&A. People have Q&A. I hope you found this class and informative um, and entertaining as well. Okay. Um, so that was the reverse. Okay, we had a question here. This was, um, I don't have a visual, I feel so unfair. Okay. People have questions, we're gonna go to Q&A right now and we'll look for raised hands and the um, attendees. Let's see who here has any, okay. Hello? How are we doing? Yeah, you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, this question might not be directly related to today's class, but I still haven't totally understood what the purpose is of debits and credits and why we need to know that. It seems like everything is very, like wh where is that different than any other entries we do? So I, I well you should have seen the today's class in itself. Uh, we have to look at adjusting entry. We have to recognize that even though we had uh, originally put in the $177 for expense, it wasn't really all expense. As of five thirty one seventy one dollars was not expense. Rent was not fifteen hundred dollars. Or rent was only five hundred dollars. Where do you do that? You don't start deleting your bills and, and recreating it. You make debits and credits. And like I said, any transaction, you know that that's not 
you know, a bill or an invoice, right? You're not creating an invoice for a customer. You're not entering a bill. That all goes to the debits and credits. Going back to the first class, originally you would have a diary of all the journal of journals of everything going on in the company, and then it would post it to the proper <coughs> ledger books. If it was accounts receivables, if it was a sales receipt, etc. So, general journal entries is really two in one. It's making the diary, but in, by itself it posts it where it belongs. How else would you? put on your company books, the fact that you're buying a house, you have a mortgage, and you're putting in your money, and you're renting, and you're closing costs. How are you doing that? The only way to do it is debits and credits. Uh, I mean, once it's added as, uh, as an asset or as an, uh, as an expense, then what? What's the, what's the expense? There's no expense. You're buying a summer home to rent out. What is it? Well, at this point, it's an asset. Well, well how, how do you put an asset on the company? Where do you put it? You get a bill? You enter a bill from, for, for $200,000 for a bungalow? And you pay for I mean, like, How does it get there? Uh -huh. That's an expense. You got a bill for $200,000. You know, overcharged lawyer for, for 10 months, it costs $200,000. That's not, that's not your asset. That's right. The whole, the whole, perm, all the permanent accounts are debits and credits. That's that's how it goes in. So, so the bank in itself, you could do that inventory. You could do that, you know, through inventory, or, et cetera. But anything else, you know, accounts receivables, maybe also, you know, you create an invoice. But a lot of what you're doing is going to require general journal entries. If you're strictly a business that only does invoices and only Again, you have to understand that when you come into a, a company, depending on what the purpose is you're hired for, you know QuickBooks. I'm not just an invoice and bill payer. Yeah, maybe some people have with your accounts receivables, account payables. You, you, you need to know what you can do as bookkeeping. You know which job you're going to be hired for and what they're going to require. You know, and, and definitely there's no way you're passing a, a, cor a course not knowing debits and credits. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, that was uh, helpful. Okay, let's see who else has a question here. Hello? Yeah. yeah. You hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, I still don't get the whole reverse thing. I, I don't understand what, I, I saw what you did, but I don't understand what, you, what you're accomplishing. I don't understand why you would want to reverse something to make it only for one day and then what? Yeah, you have to get an accurate report as of a certain day. Well, 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 well you know, in this case, we did 531, but let's say it was in December. And um, you want to know, the, that's what you want to know throughout the expense. I can't hear right. you. Can you get it? Broken up. Broken up. Yeah, so um, you're trying to figure out what was your true expense in, in different items. So right now we're showing the net income, we're showing the loss, right? That's not, you know, you know $8,000 of sales, and yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we have a, a negative net income. Why is that? Because we put in $1,500 rent in one month. Is that fair? And, and well, well, from tax, not only from tax perspective, of tax. Is that we want to look at yourself that, we're, that we should shut down the company because we're not profitable? The truth is, you are very profitable. It's only five hundred thousand a month. You can't have fifteen hundred. At, at one point, I, um, I, have to, I have to spend over a weekend figuring out some technical issues. I, I deactivated my headphones for listening, so I have a working mic and not my headphones. So if I plug in my headphones, they're not going to hear you. 
Uh, okay. Um, so you're so basically I, saying that, you, that in order to, that the company should remain profitable, you reverse certain things that were future expenses. Is that what you're saying? Well, well that's the truth. The truth is that I didn't really have $1,500. That's what bookkeeping, bookkeeping is about. You know, someone uneducated wrote out a check, say, okay, rent $1,500, I'll pay rent again in three months. No, it's really rent $500 per month. Now, if I don't need to make any reports, so then it doesn't make a difference. The real picture. The real picture is that a thousand dollars of my expense wasn't a thousand dollar expense. It was it was it was only prepaid expense. And seventy one dollars of supplies was that expense. And all of a sudden you'll see that you're not in the red, you're in the black. So how do you know when to do that for you? You did it for for five thirty one because it's let's say the end of the month, like you you'll no no I wrote in my in my example, the bank requested financials. So when you're doing financials, now we're sitting down to make an accounting. Usually, you know, usually the cutoff is a year because that because that the, the tax person wants. Right. But if you're going for loans and you want to know, uh, for example, if you're paying a mortgage now, right? How do you look at your mortgage? Do all your payments pay down your principal? No, right? You have principal and interest. Right. So is all your payments interest? No. Now, do you have to figure out every single month what's going on? So, no, there's two ways to do it. You either say that I'm paying down every, all my payments are interest. At the end of the year, when I realize I get my form from the bank that this is how much we received, you make an adjustment that whatever is in excess of what the bank said is really not interest as principal. I prefer actually the other way. Is that I just because then because then you have to make a calculation. What's the difference of your interest expense to the bank's interest expense? But I take the payment and I pay down the whole principal as much as long as I do it. And when I get a, a, a statement, an interest statement, then I just make one. I don't make cheshbonus. I just take the number of the interest and I I increase my loan, my principal by the interest. So again, you don't have to do it from month to month. But when you but but when you're doing a tax return, you you need to do that and the adjusting entry. If you're applying for a refinance, sometimes you have to make this adjustment because you've been applying all your money, all to principal or all to interest. Now you got to split it up. You got to make a recollection. What um, I mean, you have to make a um, calculation. Calculation. What was it really? Okay, right? so you're you saying so basically. Dollars. So basically, you went to you made a special journal entry to be reversed, or you could reverse right, any no, entry that you no, did. No, you, you no, know, the entry you make is an adjusting entry. What we make is we have to adjust. What what I have been doing until now is not proper, right? I have to make an adjustment. So last year, adjustment. So I'm going to say now that you know it wasn't all principal. I have to recognize that X amount was interest. Because and in this case you have to because you're going you might show you're much more profitable because all your payments was paying interest you had no expense. You improve the loan if if you would show the interest expense so you can't hide that you have to make an adjustment and say you're right um, I wasn't paying principal all the time part of it was really interest and so you have to go through different accounts and flag them. Not well, a that's a little, you, have, you have to go back to all these transactions. It's much harder to flag it. Why can't you do it you as you go, go You don't go to all your transactions. You go to your accounts, your chart of accounts. You go through your accounts and you say, which account would be changeable? Right? Assets that are fixed assets get depreciation. You have to adjust it. Your you bank, it for, it's anything that, that could depreciate? Is that what you're saying? Depreciation is one example of an asset. Your bank is not adjusting, right? Your bank is staying the way it was. But uh, you have uh, payroll. You got to adjust payroll because um, you're not paying, uh, you know, you, you, have, you have to realize how much uh, payroll expense do I recognize for this period? You know, my check was um, December 18th. Am I really recognizing a whole two week payroll just in January? They work one day. The truth is that 13 days out of it was in December. So make an adjustment and recognize, you make an adjusting entry, recognize an employee expense of the 13 days or that you have to do. But then 
you don't want to make a check for one day in January. You're not making two checks. One check for 13 days, one check for, for one day. So you make first adjusting entry for 13 days. Then you reverse it. By reversing it, you're putting in a negative to next year. So I put a negative of 13 days, a positive one day. So even though I, I, I'm writing a check for 14 days, and next year I'm only gonna recognize one day of payroll, and that's the accomplishment of the reverse. So the adjusting lets me get 13 days this year, and the reverse lets me only get one day next year. This is very brainy. Okay, I think yeah, I understand. Maybe we have to do a little review on that, but... Uh, yeah, but I, think I understand it more than before, that's for sure. Okay, well, thank you so much. Yeah, so everything we try to do twice, you know, we do it and then we, we reinforce it following so to, to, get, to get the point home. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, no problem. If anyone has a question, please let me know. Um, Hello? No, 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 it's not. Try again, of course. Mm. Stop share. Let me just stop recording.